So we're very happy again that we have the chance to have our PhD students here, Bruno Montiwiller and Olga Willow from us in the Department of Geography here at the University of Tartu to provide some background on working with grid climate data in Titan. And again, we uh, have put the effort in to prepare an online notebook. Eventually, um, this will be shared so everybody who wants can follow that workshop in life, clicking it through yourself. We will also share the materials later. And um, then I guess without further ado, I would like uh, to give the floor to Bruno and Olga. Right. And I guess I'll start by sharing my screen. Right, and first of all, I'll put a couple of links in the chat. Um, so first of all, we have the GitHub repo uh, for this workshop. And then I'll also add, as we're using uh, Binder to run this uh, notebook that we have for the workshop, uh, here's the direct Binder link um, that you can launch yourself. Right, and I'm going to start by launching Binder myself as well. So should should not take that long to launch. And after it's uh, launched, then Bruno will give a kind of a theoretical introduction to this uh, workshop, which focuses on trend analysis and uh, conducting this trend analysis using some Python libraries, primarily X-Array uh, and Pandas. Maybe I can already start talking, or do you want to wait, Holger? Uh, yeah, it should launch, I mean, soon. Okay. Maybe as a side note here for our um, guests. So this binder is uh, basically a online services is hosted, supported by many of the also larger cloud um, IT companies, as well as the European the Research Consortium. And uh, basically, it's sort of a pre-configured setup to, to literally run those uh, Jupyter notebooks. And uh, as you can really see in the upper right side, the size of the machine that is backing each uh, notebook is, of course, a little bit limited. Um, so if you want to do large scale analysis, of course, you should then eventually have your own last step of those type of interactive workshops and to share results. Um, uh, this is a really nice practical tool. And this notebook should work the same way eventually also on your computer if you intend to download the environment. Okay, we go over there. Hey, thanks, Alex. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you all for your presence and interest in our workshop uh, entitled Spatial, Spatial Temporal Trend Analysis on Temperature Using Python. Uh, during this workshop, we will demonstrate how to handle net CDF datasets and also how to use and how to apply main candle trend tests on these datasets. And in addition, we are also going to demonstrate how to calculate the tail sand uh, estimator using also Python programming language. Uh, to this end, we, uh, we use a gridded daily mean temperature data set. 
that is actually provided by the European Climate Assessment uh, and Data Set, which is under Copernic Copernicus program. And this data set is actually developed for the entire Europe uh, using the weather station data set that is provided by the national or national agency of each European country. And, and the data set is actually created since 1950 until, until nowadays. But for this workshop, we are going to be using only from January 2001 until December 2020. And we also already aggregate these daily mean temperature values into monthly basis. So we, what we are going to be using here is the mean temperature on monthly basis. And also to reduce uh, and to increase the speed of processing, we also cropped the data set already for the entire Baltics for the three states, uh, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. So the idea is that for each pixel of this data set, we will be, we will be calculating the main candle on monthly basis. Uh, we will take, for example, January uh, 2001, January 2002, until January 2020, and use the time series of that respective pixels to calculate uh, the trend. Uh, that's why we call spatial temporal analysis. The main candle test is actually a non-parametric test that has been widely used to identify temporal trends in the time series of climate data and also in other environmental analysis. As uh, the, the MK is a non-parametric test, it does not require any like assumption regarding the distribution of the data. But actually it only requires that the, the time series should not be autocorrelated. Uh, so the idea is that uh, to identify the trends in this time series, the main, the main candle test first calculates the difference between all pairs of points of earlier, earlier and later points in the time series. So every value of the whole time series is compared with the previous values. After uh, acquire all the pairwise difference of these pairwise combinations, it, calcul it calculates the variance of this difference and which you be, which you be then used uh, to calculate the Z score or the Z value the, and this uh, and the value or the sign of this uh, Z value is going to indicate if the trend is decreasing for the case where the Z value is negative or if the trend is increasing in the case where Z value is positive. Uh, we also use, or the main candle also use the Z value to indicate how significant is that trend. And for example, for this workshop, we define it uh, as significant trends, those that have a confidence level of 95%. Uh, in addition to the calculation of the main, main candle, we will also be using the tail sand estimator, which provides us or can allow us to have a magnitude or a number that demonstrates the magnitude of the trend. The tail sand estimator is actually given by the median value of all of the slopes of all pairs of sample points of the time series. Uh, I think as a theoretical background, that would be all from me. Uh, we have add some links where you can go uh, later on and check uh, more deeper instructions and information about the, the main candle and the tail sand slope. And I think now I will pass the floor to my friend Holliger, who, who will describe the coding steps. I hope you all enjoyed the workshop. Right, thanks for the intro. Uh, yeah, as I mentioned before, X-Array is the library that's of the main focus today. But uh, to give an overview of what the libraries will be using, so data loading, we're going to be using uh, intake, uh, which yeah, some of you might have been in this. Uh, Tuesday's workshop last week, uh, Isaac also used the same library. Then for data processing and wrangling, we're using X-Array, Pandas, and NumPy. Then we're going to do uh, some plotting, which will be done with Matplotlib. And the trend analysis itself will be carried out using Pi, Candle. 
which is uh, a Python library specifically for applying uh, the MK test uh, in Python. So as always, we'll start with importing the libraries that we need. And uh, so, our, so this temperature uh, data uh, will be an etcdf file. Uh, I had a couple of links here in the uh, introduction. Uh, there's actually a YouTube tutorial by Copernicus Marine Service, which talks about netcdf files. Um, but this netcdf file is uh, located in uh, our university's own, uh, own cloud folder. And it's a uh, uh, kind of a YAML file, if you're familiar with this. So this is how the file looks like. Um, but uh, we're going to use intake uh, to open this catalog. And we can see that there are two files uh, in this catalog, out of which we only use temperature. So if you want to check out what this temperature file contains, uh, we're going to read uh, the metadata. Uh, we have this catalog object called cat that we created. And what we can see is the URL path for this uh, folder that this file is located at, the description, um, then the driver, which says that we're dealing with a netcdf file, and also the link to this uh, GitHub uh, repository where this catalog file is located at. And now we can actually start uh, reading in the actual data set. So we're going to read it in as an X-Array data set. So this X-Array library is kind of meant for um, working with multi-dimensional dimensional array uh, data sets. And it kind of borrows elements from, uh, for example, Pandas, NumPy, as well as Raster.io. So if you have used any of these libraries, uh, certain kind of functions will uh, kind of feel si similar to those. And we'll simply use read to import the data. And now we can see how this file actually looks like. So what this X-ray dataset has, it has dimensions, coordinates, data variables, and attributes. In our case, uh, the dimensions are kind of uh, made up by three dimensions. So we have two that are the sort of spatial uh, dimensions, which are the latitude and longitude coordinates for our grid cells uh, in the Baltics. So um, we can see that they are essentially arrays. Uh, we have more latitudes, coordinates, and longitudes. And this combination of 57 latitudes and 72 longitude coordinates means that in total, we're going to have a little over, over 4,000 uh, unique locations, which are these grid cells of the Baltics. Um, and then we have the YM dimension which is uh, the combination of uh, year and month. Uh, and as we have 20 years worth of monthly uh, temperature mean values, in total, we're going to have 240 uh, monthly uh, values. Um, and we can also see that there's some sort of a coordinate called spatial ref. Um, so this is actually this indicates that there's some sort of a coordinate reference system attached to our data set. And if we display it um, using the attributes property, we can see that we're dealing with a data set that has the classic WGS84, uh, which is the world uh, geodetic uh, system, uh, this kind of standard coordinate reference system attached to it. And now this data variable, this single data variable that we have called temp mean. So these are the mean temperature, monthly mean temperature values of the Baltics uh, for our study period. And essentially we have almost a million uh, values 
um, in this uh, temp mean variable. Because like I said, we have for each grid cell, uh, we have 240 monthly values in total. And now to see what it looks visually. Um, so first of all, for selecting um, a specific monthly kind of slice, uh, we can use the cell command short for select. And we can see that uh, instead of those 240 months, we only have uh, January 2001. Uh, next, if we want to only look at specifically the temp mean uh, array, we just simply add temp mean in uh, square brackets, similar to pandas, if we're calling columns in pandas. And for plotting, there is simply the default plot command. Uh, so this is uh, January 2001, uh, the mean temperature uh, values for the Baltics. And you can see that latitude and longitude automatically end up in the correct uh, axis. So to go on with our trend analysis, so first we have this sort of pre-processing stage uh, where we're going to convert the X-ray data set into a pandas data frame for more kind of convenient uh, uh, data handling. Then we're going to group the data by location, uh, which means latitude, longitude, and month. And we're going to extract uh, those group temperature values for each location for each month as NumPy arrays uh, in a separate column. So we'll start by converting the data set into a pandas data frame. So for this, is, there's kind of this self-explanatory command to data frame. And we're going to also use reset index to sort of flatten the data frame. Uh, so we're getting only one row for each uh, latitude, longitude, and uh, month uh, combination. Um, next, uh, we're going, so what we already see is that we're actually not seeing any proper temperature mean values uh, in this sample that uh, Jupiter is showing us, which means that there's a lot of uh, missing values actually in this uh, column. So where these missing values come from? Well, they're essentially the grid cells that fall outside our study area, which means the neighboring countries, which we clipped out as well as the Baltic Sea itself, where we don't have any temperature data. So we need to get rid of those before going on with the trend analysis. And we're going to use the drop NA command, which uh, drops uh, the missing values. Um, and we can see already that we're going to, so we already lost uh, sort of 300,000 rows, which were all the rows that had a missing value in the temp mean column. Next, for our convenience, we're going to split the YM year month combination column uh, into separate year and month columns and converting those into integers. Um, so we're going to use the split command while specifying the delimiter, which is dash in our case. And we're using expand true to say that whatever the output of the split command is that we should get uh, two separate columns, in our case, year and month. We're going to run this. And we're also, like I said, uh, setting the type uh, as integer in our output. Um, now we're also going to sort the data frame by year and month. Because in order to get correct results out of our trend analysis, we need to make sure that uh, the wrong, so that the years and months both will be in the correct order so that uh, when we apply, apply the trend analysis, um, year 2001 comes before 2002 and January uh, comes before February uh, and so on. So we're going to use the sort values command for that and saying that we have two columns that we're going to sort by and saying that we want both uh, in the ascending order. 
and in place through means that uh, we're conducting this uh, uh, sorting uh, in place uh, uh, within the same data frame objects. Uh, and finally, we're getting to the grouping. So like I said, we're grouping by both location month, uh, so both by latitude, longitude, as well as uh, the month column. And we're going to use the group by function for pandas for that. Uh, we need to specify in square brackets our three uh, columns used uh, for aggregating. And we're saying that um, the column that uh, the function will be applied to is uh, temperature mean. Um, now, uh, we're going to have these um, uh, temperature, monthly temperature mean values as uh, the output will be a NumPy array. So we're going to use the apply function and saying that the output should be put into a NumPy array. So we're going to get for each latitude, longitude, and month combination um, an array which is which has length 20 for 20 years. And for each of those years, we're going to get uh, the temperature mean value. So uh, we get this new object called temp group TF. And if we check the content of this uh, uh, new array column, we're going to select the uh, first row. You can do it by iLock, which says that we're going to select the row with the index zero. Uh, so the indexing starts uh, at zero, like Python list, for example. And we can see that this array is uh, in this row. Uh, this should have the length 20. Right. And now we can finally get to the trend analysis itself. So like I said in the beginning, we have the Pime and Kendall library uh, for this um, MK test. Um, and yeah, I actually had the link to this uh, uh, library as well. Um, but this uh, library ha has 13 different versions of the MK test available. So they have like seasonal versions uh, um, other than the original version, uh, which we uh, cited in the beginning in the introduction. But we're going to use actually just the original uh, test, with, which literally is called the function original test. And the test has an output, uh, which is uh, these name, named parameters. Uh, in total, there should be nine of those. Uh, so we have a parameter which tells if the trend is increasing, decreasing, or there is no uh, significant trend detected. Uh, we have the p-value of the significance test. Uh, we have certain uh, test statistics. And we also have the TLSN estimator or the slope, which we talked about in the beginning. Um, so if we test this function now, so I'm going to take uh, only the first uh, uh, row of this uh, group DF again, and uh, I'm going to get the array, uh, so the temp mean column content. And the output is, uh, yeah similar to the list we have here. So we have uh, nine different parameters. And in this case, so the month of January for 2001 for this uh, uh, location, uh, actually there's no significant trend. Uh, we can see that the p-value is uh, way above 0.05. Um, yeah, so this, this first row, uh, there's a uh, no trend detected. And now we do the same for each one of those rows in the data frame. So we're going to use the apply function again. Um, and we're going to loop over these rows uh, and apply the MK test each time um, using the same confidence level we had here, which is 95%. So I've even written here that uh, 
this uh, might take some time because we're going to uh, do the same uh, uh, process uh, over 30,000 times because, because we have over 30,000 rows in our data frame. Uh, and I think, yeah, I've even written here the time. So this should output also the time it takes us to run this. So, so in my test, it went either four, in between 40 seconds and a minute. But our two gigabytes of RAM should be enough, so we shouldn't run out of memory. Yes. Hopefully, yeah. Yeah, but this row-wise uh, iterations uh, in bigger data frames, actually, this is not that big, but this can uh, be quite time consuming. And if you had 100,000 rows, it might not even uh, run. You mean on a normal laptop or like this? So yeah, yeah. Uh, prove it or... with a limit of two gigs of RAM. Right, okay, so we're done now. Uh, so yeah, 54 seconds. Uh, yeah, and so we're using, yeah, not even half of the RAM that uh, we are al allowed to have. Right, and uh, so we, so this output actually, well, actually you can see that. Uh, so now it's simply a long tuple with, with nine values. Uh, unfortunately, they don't have the parameter names attached to these. So, uh, but we know that we need only trend, the P value and the slope. So the indices we need are zero, two and seven. So we're going to, um, get the result of this uh, MK test into three separate columns so that we have um, everything nice and separate. Um, now next, um, yeah, so actually now we can already check um, the significant trends for each one of the, uh, our months. So here I'm looping through uh, the months uh, in this data frame, so 1 to 12. Um, so I'm also grouping the data frame by months again. And I'm going to print out um, these three trend classes we have. So no trend, decreasing, and increasing for each one of our months uh, to see how many significant trends actually uh, we get. Uh, right, and we can see that, for example, for January, no significant trends were detected. Same for February, uh, but for April, we actually can see that at least 11 cells had an increasing trend. Uh, so even better for June, June looks more exciting. We have increasing trends, um, etc. So this is... Uh, right, okay, yeah. It's just that um, you can, of course, um, maybe point this towards the end of the workshop, but uh, if it's not so many questions, maybe it makes sense to ask them. Right, so the can the apply not be rewritten to a matrix format? Uh, maybe. Uh, I know that for my I'm not sure what you mean by rewritten to a matrix format. Um, from, from my take, I think what it means is maybe the way you can uh, apply NumPy, not apply, if you just multiply, for example, two NumPy arrays, you don't have to run an apply. But I think in this particular right, right. case, um, okay. the semantics for, for a data frame are a bit more convenient to uh, easily read it. Right? Yeah. I think that's what one of the sort of uh, aims here. It's, it's not immediately optimized for, for perfect performance. Yeah, I think, yeah, uh, okay, yeah. For it, with matrix, uh, I guess you mean to like speed it up. And actually in my original tests, uh, I also kind of converted um, 
um, instead of to apply a data frame based uh, MK test application, I converted uh, the data into a NumPy array and then uh, I kind of was checking if it's faster, but in this case, actually, it wasn't that much faster. I think 10 seconds or something uh, was the difference. But uh, yeah, I mean, arrays are definitely more computer friendly, I guess. Uh, and bigger stuff you're not doing uh, row wise, probably. Yes. Uh, right. Hopefully, that answers the question. Um, so where were we? Right. So next. Um, so when we eventually plot our uh, trend classes to see where the significant trends uh, are located spatially, uh, for plotting we would uh, need uh, numeric uh, data. So the classes would need to be numeric. Um, so here I have a simple function, like an if else based statement, pretty much. Um, so that we could uh, convert our text-based uh, trend classes, no trend, increasing, decreasing, um, into no trend would be zero, uh, decreasing minus one, and increasing one. And now we're going to also apply it, uh, our custom-made function numeric trend, we're going to apply to the data frame. So I'm saying that the input uh, would be the slope column as well as the p-value column. So uh, in our case, p-value would be, uh, yeah, it is, uh, yeah, so it would have to be below 0.05, right? And as an output, uh, we'll get our numeric trend column. Um, right, and before plotting, I'm going to actually convert the data frame back into an X array data set um, uh, because the plotting will be done uh, using uh, the combination of the X array and Matplotlib. So uh, this can be done uh, with the two X array commands. Um, so, first of all, uh, we would like uh, our new dimensions in this new data set to be uh, the coordinates, so latitude, longitude as well as month. So uh, first of all, we're going to set an index to our data frame, uh, uh, which uh, we're going to use the same columns that we would like to uh, end up as dimensions in our X-ray data set. So I'm going to set the index using latitude, longitude, and month. And then I'm going to convert it into an X-ray data set. And then I'm going to use um, sort of extension called uh, Rio X-Array, uh, which is meant for this kind of um, spatial operations using X-Array data sets. So in our case, uh, we'd like to um, have our data set in the WGS uh, coordinate reference system again, like we had uh, in the original source data set. So I'm going to use the write CRS command and based on the EPSG code, um, so this code means that we're using uh, WGS84. And temporary will be our output data set. Uh, and what we can see is that our data variables are um, both the temperature values as well as those uh, MK test uh, output parameters. So P, slope, uh, yeah, trend, numeric trend. Right. And now we're getting to the plotting stage, which is quite a substantial part of uh, this workshop. So first of all, um, we're going to plot the slope parameter, which is this teal sen estimator, which shows uh, how much the temperature has changed per year for each month. Um, so here, um, first of all, for looping, we're going to create the plot for each month, um, simply um, creating a list of months, which were uh, looped through. Uh, now for plotting these monthly slope values, um, uh, yeah, we're doing it using Matplotlib. So, um, I mean, if anyone has used Matplotlib before, then 
the figure and subplot setup is kind of similar. So we're creating a grid of uh, four times three of uh, matplotlib axes, uh, which we need for each one of our months. And uh, during this iteration, we're going to loop over to 12 months and their corresponding axes. And we'll, each time we'll select a corresponding uh, monthly dataset slice from temporary using the select command. And we're going to plot those slope values uh, into that specific uh, subplot. Uh, right. So I'll run this first plot we have. So we're plotting using the plot command we had in the beginning. We're plotting the slope variable. Uh, here I'm also uh, assigning a color map. And uh, I would like the degree symbol, the proper degree symbol for Celsius uh, to be used uh, for the color bar. So I'm setting the color bar keyword arguments in this uh, dictionary. And we're also uh, setting a title for our plot. Right. Um, and what we can see here is that Okay, uh, and the colors are nice and all, but if you look at the color bars, then the ranges don't really match up. Uh, they were assigned for each month separately. So if we now would like to compare that for which months were the changes most drastic, we cannot really do it visually because uh, the colors don't really, uh, you know, the range, uh, ranges are actually different. Uh, so we would like to uh, recreate the plot uh, so that uh, each time the color bar range would be the same for each uh, month so that we could hopefully see both the spatial and the temporal patterns of these uh, slope values uh, better. Yeah, actually, I forgot that I have it in text here as well, actually. Um, right. So to do that, we're going to manually um, create um, our kind of color bar uh, uh, range. So first of all, um, I'm going to get for each month, both the minimum and maximum slope values um, and collect these into a list. So we're going to loop through the months each time, selecting that monthly slice from temporary um, and I'm going to get the minimum and max slope values and rounding them also. And we get this, uh, so this I would call the kind of potential list of color bar levels, I would say. Uh, now here we have duplicates because uh, they might have had the same min and max values uh, for different mo uh, months. So I'm going to reduce this list um, into uh, these unique kind of uh, levels. So here we get the C bar levels uh, variable. So this is kind of the range, uh, which would be from minus 0.2 uh, to 0.4, which should cover the total possible uh, range of slope values we have for the whole data set uh, over all of the 12 months. And we have a step of 0.1. So these will be the color bar level ticks. In this case, we had kind of random uh, ticks for the color bars. Right. And oh, yeah, actually, I have this uh, extra cell. So if you want the text based uh, month names, uh, we'll use the built in Python library calendar to get uh, instead of this one to 12, we get you know, January, February. So we're also going to use this for our subplot titles. Right, so now we'll recreate the same plot using our user-defined color bar levels and uh, titles. Um, yeah, so in this case, I'm specifying the levels uh, using our C bar levels uh, variable. And I'm also going to say that the ticks should go to the same uh, locations uh, that we have the levels at. 
right? And now you can see that we have the same color bar for each one of our subplots. And now we can actually kind of compare the months in terms of where temperature uh, has changed the most. And essentially the darkest blues are where the changes have been the more uh, the biggest. So we have February stands out. Uh, actually, the winter months uh, also, uh, yeah, November and December. And July looks to be the only month with kind of decreasing trends. Um, at least it stands out. And there's no real spatial pattern, uh, I would say, uh, in our temperature changes. So this change is uh, uh, degrees Celsius per year uh, for the over the whole 20 year period. Right. Uh, and but regardless of these kind of slope values, we're not yet sure if these trends are actually significant. So we can't tell that for sure that we can over this 20 year period say that uh, temperature has changed uh, you know significantly February or July. So we're going to now plot locations uh, of the grid cells where significant trends were actually detected by the MK test. So first of all, I'm going to simply use the default options and plotting the numeric trends, which we converted from the text-based uh, trend classes. Um, so the output uh, looks like this and we can actually already tell that something is not right because for example um, january and april uh, most of the trends should be actually well most of the cells actually should have no trends but the colors end up kind of being mixed up and uh, this is why because uh, by default the a plotting function simply loop through our color map, which are these three column columns. So the idea is that decreasing should be brown, no trend gray, and increasing this kind of uh, turquoise uh, or teal column. But uh, as we did manually specify which class should uh, should get which color, they end up being kind of messed up. So now we do have to do some manual labor to get rid of this kind of random color assignment. Uh, so for that, we need to make sure that uh, the correct, correct colors will be assigned to the correct uh, trend classes when plotting. And we would also like to create the legend that is kind of more suitable for this qualitative data because now we're not doing uh, dealing with this continuous uh, slope values anymore, but we actually have only three possible kind of values that we could use, which are the trend classes. So we wouldn't like a color bar rather than, let's say this a single legend below the whole uh, total plot. So we're going to have some custom functions to get uh, rid of this issue. So first of all, first of all, I'm creating a function called get numeric trend classes so the idea behind this function is that we need to have some way of getting uh, for each month only which classes existed uh, in that month. Because if you remember, we printed out um, this month-based uh, list of significant trends. We can see that, for example, January shouldn't have any other trend class other than no trends. And for example, April should have only two uh, trend classes. Um, so we need to make sure that only those uh, existing classes end up being uh, uh, taken out. So the idea of this function is that I'm going to input a monthly data set slice. I'm going to get the min and max uh, trend values. In this case, we have the numeric trends. So for example, min could be minus one and the max uh, one. And then I'm going to if needed, also use NumPy uh, arrange to sort of fill in the missing. Uh, so actually, this is only for the uh, for the case where 
minimum is minus one and max is one. So we need to get uh, zero, the no trend class somehow in here as well. Uh, right. Uh, we're, I'm going to test the function uh, below as well. So we have another function now called get, get C map, which takes the output of these um, existing trend classes within one monthly slice and then assigns the correct uh, colors for each one of those uh, uh, trend classes. So that uh, decreasing would get the brown color, no trend gray, uh, and increasing the teal or turquoise color. So first of all, uh, we should create the color dictionary, which is also ordered correctly. So I'm using the ordered dict um, uh, data type from the collections package to ensure that uh, each time uh, colors uh, would be assigned in the correct order. So starting from brown, which is the decreasing one uh, and so on. And this color dictionary will be the input of this get, C, get C map uh, function along with the output of the numeric trend classes function. So what this function does, uh, it gets the color, colors, then loops over these numeric trend classes and um, then it appends from the color dictionary, it calls out the correct color and appends to our list. And the output will be the matplotlib uh, color map object that only has the colors that are needed for these existing trend classes. So in the case of simply one uh, no trend class, we would only get uh, a color map which uh, has only the gray color in it. Right, and here I'm going to test these. So for example, if you have the months of November, uh, just to check, we should only have uh, no trend or increasing trend cells. And if we scroll above, so this is November, uh, right? Yeah, so we only should have increasing and no trend cells. So the function works. So the get CMAP function output actually that we can't really see at the moment because uh, as you can see, it's a listed color map object from the matplotlib library. Uh, right. And finally, uh, for our legend, so as I talked about, we would like a single legend below our um, plot, which would have uh, those three colors and those three corresponding trend classes. So I'm creating a sort of list of patches. So these patches are matplotlib uh, patch objects. So these are kind of labeled colors. So we have, um, for each one of our colors, we have a corresponding label, which is the class. Uh, so I'm using this, and this will be the input of our legend. So now we can uh, sort of recreate our improved plot uh, using the functions uh, uh, we just created. So here I'm, again, get, getting the monthly slice from temporary then I'm getting the existing trend classes for this specific month with our uh, get trend classes function. And that will be the input of our get C map uh, color map assignment function. And this uh, custom made color map will be used as an input for our uh, plotting. Uh, and I'm using add color bar fa false to say that instead of color bar, I'm going to use the legend uh, later instead and yeah so this uh, legend function uh, has a parameter called handles which we're going to use our patches our patch objects and we're going to say that we want a legend uh, lower center so below our plot in the middle and b box to anchor so these are kind of plot coordinates so 0.5 means that it sh should go in the center of the plot and minus 0.05 means that it's slightly below the um, actual uh, subplots. And we want uh, three separate columns. So uh, the colors should be kind of in all in one row. 
And that's also the output uh, we get. So we have this single legend. And now the uh, kind of picture is already significant different from our kind of default kind of false uh, plot we had in, in the beginning. So now we can see that in most of the months, actually no uh, significant trend uh, was detected, which we also see, uh, which we also saw when we plotted or printed those uh, that list of uh, monthly significant trends, those counts uh, in the beginning. Uh, and we can see that sort of the increasing trends, there's no real uh, temporal pattern as they exist both in summer months as well as uh, in the colder months. But what you can see that surprisingly in the northern kind of part of our study area, which is the country of Estonia, uh, no significant increasing trends were actually detected. And most of the increasing trends end up in the kind of southern half sort of of our study area, which is Latvia and Lithuania. So in the case of June, they're more in the western edges of uh, Lit uh, Lithuania and uh, Latvia. November, pretty much all of Latvia and Lithuania indicated an increasing trend uh, in temperature. Uh, but on the other hand, the only significant decreasing trends were detected in uh, July, and specifically for some reason in eastern Estonia. Uh, so we currently don't have the literature, the scientific articles on hand uh, to say if these uh, results uh, make any sense. Hopefully they do. At least I know that for November and October, uh, as of well September, they uh, are true. Uh, right, but this what the show is kind of that despite having these um, kind of highest slope values, which means the temperature um, sort of magnitude had, was the biggest in February, for example, uh, that didn't mean that those trends uh, were actually significant because February actually showed no significant trends. So this is something that yeah, this is the reason we both plot, plotted uh, slope values themselves as well as location of the significant trends. Uh, right. And yeah, I'm not sure if we're running out of time actually, but so something that I had as an additional final addition to this notebook is that we did all this manual work and uh, actually x-ray has kind of these shortcuts for kind of quick overviews uh, where you can you might not be able to customize the plot um, uh, that well compared to what we did but uh, you can quickly kind of check out uh, and create this kind of automatic plot uh, for each one of our months so instead of looping through each one of the months selecting the monthly slice and then uh, specifying all of those color bars. Uh, what I just recently found out myself that uh, X-ray has this, for example, one liner that literally does the work for us. So uh, we're going to say that we're going to plot the slope values, but we're not saying uh, specifically which month each time. We're simply specifying that the sort of uh, Kind of iteration column or the aggregation column should be months. Uh, and it automatically knows that it needs to do this 12 times. And we're using column uh, wrap, say that we have we should get three plots per row. And we don't need to loop through the axis and so on. And we kind of get already, uh, yeah, maybe the color, yeah, the default colors might might not be the best, uh, might be a bit too intense. But uh, so this is a, basically a quick one liner to check out what your data actually looks like. Uh, right. And that's actually it from my side as well now. Um, and I can see that there's a few questions. Now. Yes, I think I can maybe start, in, start to answer. The first question actually was about uh, removing the NA values. 
Uh, and then I think by answer this question also I already answered Dimitri's question that was the last one. So actually in the metadata of the data that we use, they say that there, uh, it's supposed to have no NA values in the time series. But since we use this data set in a previous research, we, even though they say it's written that, uh, we look at for missing values in the time series. And actually uh, we couldn't find anyone, at least in, in the time period that we use in our analysis from 2001 to 2020. Uh, and then Holliger showed that uh, he dropped it, uh, or we dropped it, these NA values, because actually in the moment that we, we crop it or we reduce the European time series uh, data set for the Baltic, uh, Baltics area, all those pixels that were outside of the country's borders, they were, they were assigned as new values. So that's the reason we, we uh, those ones that we drop it are actually the pixels that would be outside of our study area. Uh, but definitely, definitely, if you take like an additional or a, an alternative data set, then you should uh, verify and look for these missing values that they would highly affect the results. And then if you have, uh, for example, a missing value, you can definitely use some kind of interpo interpolation to assign a new value to that uh, pixel in that date, for example. I don't know if you have something to add, Oliver. Yeah, I mean, uh, this the data set sort of, uh, or the array sort of gets filled out. So uh, uh, up to the kind of total extent of uh, the, if you use like uh, uh, any kind of uh, remote sensing data, for example, some raster data. Uh, then you have this kind of extent that is defined by these cor corner coordinates. So it's kind of similar that, um, uh, yeah, those uh, missing values end up being kind of, you know, uh, used to fill out sort of the uh, kind of rectangle that is the total extent of the politics. Then there was, <clears throat> sorry. Then there was also another question of Vladimir. Uh, if have we tried to use daily, weekly data instead of monthly average? Uh, well, in fact, we have not tried to use weekly and neither daily data. I think for this type of analysis, maybe daily, weekly would be, especially if you are analyzing like a long term, I think would be highly variable which means that it would be very hard to find a, a trend because the variability would be so high. Uh, for example, I know that in precipitation analysis, they have, uh, it's, it's a bit more complicated to find trends because of the high variability, for example. Uh, but I know that in the climatological research, they usually, usually use monthly values. But for example, here we use average, but you could use, for example, analyze the minimal temperature monthly on monthly base or the maximum temperature on monthly base. So you could analyze the patterns or the trends of these extreme temperature values, uh, higher or lower. But I believe that daily, weekly would be too much variability. For example, if you take May 1st of 2000 and then compare with May 1st of 2001, 2002, it would be too much uh, like variability. And I believe it would be very hard to find a trend by weekly or daily on daily basis. So we see that Tauri has, uh, with the command he has used uh, for plotting all plots in the same color bar. Right, okay. Yes, I just mentioned because uh, you didn't, because uh, you kind of po post that as a problem. So probably you wanted to do it just as a discrete, but uh, that what I found is very handy if I want to have all the plots exactly in the same scale. Right, yeah. And then this, I get uh, continuous color bar. Yeah, this plotting is a whole like art actually. Uh, you need to do a lot of, if you want everything perfect, uh, you can spend like a lot of time customizing stuff. 
I know a lot of times that's true. Okay, and there is one other question about variability in the data. Uh, do you have any feeling? Uh, I'm not sure if I got the question actually. Feeling about the variability in the slope values, if the trends are making sense or? Yeah, sorry for putting my mic on. Um, what I mean by this is uh, like, when you look at the daily variability, so you're doing a monthly average, but inside a month, you can have a lot of variability. So how much sense that you average mean? And when you start comparing the different years, so let's say that you take 2001 May against 2005 May, how your internal variability, did that change or does it play a role in your analysis? Mm, I think it may play a role, but I believe that on monthly you would have at least, not like a big picture, but an overall pattern for that month, which I'm not really sure if this overall pattern would be possible to find using daily values. I know that the variability inside of the same months can be high, but I, I don't think you would have like a better uh, overall picture of what's happening that month using daily values. No, my, but I mean, uh, average is one. You could also use the medium, for example. If you see that um, there are a lot of values in one area, let's say that it is back, back in May and you have a high amount of values between 17 and 19 degrees, so you, you could say, okay, I'm not taking the medium, or I'm not taking the average, but I'm taking the medium. Yes, yes, uh, this could be, yeah, it's a good point. I, I believe, I believe now we took the median because we did a box plot of the temperatures distribution for the whole area. And for most of the months, it kind of show like a, for temperature, a normal distribution because the median value was close to the mean value. No, no, um, no, no. Perfect. That is perfect. I don't want to jeopardize the, the meeting too much. So that's that's perfect. No, you did an okay. unbo unbox sort of uh, analysis. That's great. Okay. Just to add, also for, uh, we did the same for precipitation, and then it was completely not normal distributed. So I believe a median will be more meaningful for precipitation, for example. I would agree. Uh, thanks for the question. Is it guys? Uh, Gijs. Gijs, oh, that's yeah, probably. Yes. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot for, for the contribution. Um, are there other questions? Overall, I think we have managed to tackle also the questions from the chat. So as mentioned before, we, the, the, the meeting is recorded and um, the official airing of those, um, the official airing of those uh, presentations will happen again within the EGU on on Thursday. But after that, um, we'll make the materials and possibly also those recordings here um, accessible at least here to our community. So, thanks thanks for joining us from EDAB and the other channels, and we'll be happy if you. You know, keep following us a little bit what we do, and at the same time, we will try to provide more useful content over the next weeks and months. So, thanks everybody.